7 o'clock in New York City at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. We're going to be taking you down to our nation's capital for the 66th annual National Prayer Breakfast. Been held every year. Usually the guest speaker is the President of the United States. Been held since Dwight David Eisenhower lived at 1600 Pennsylvania. That's when they used to do it in black and white because I've seen the footage. <laughs> it was Carson a lot Wentz different is going to be speaking today. Right. About what? I'm sure about the Super Bowl right. and probably the challenges that he's faced over the last year, being injured and having someone else step in his place and win the Super Bowl. It's all yeah, about faith. Still, right. uh, still being a runner-up as MVP of the league, even though you got uh, missed out half the year. Meanwhile, it's going to be interesting to see if the president brings up Arnold Schwarzenegger not doing well at The Apprentice because he, he did brought that, that up last, last year. year. Do you think he'll bring yeah. it up again? Probably not. Uh, he's kind of a new material kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, we've got uh, we're going to talk to Kellyanne Conway in just a moment. But first, a brand new bombshell in that uranium one. Scale. Handle. There is explosive new details from an FBI informant, and it all centers around that lady right there, Hillary Clinton. And this is just a lead-in to Griff Jenkins, because he knows all this already. <laughs> uh, right, Griff? Because we asked you to do this. That's right. Good morning, guys. The informant's name is Douglas Campbell, and in a statement submitted to three congressional committees obtained by the Hill newspaper, Campbell claims Russian nuclear officials told him that Moscow hired American lobbying firm APCO Worldwide for $3 million in hopes of influencing then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton through contributions to her husband's foundation. Campbell writes, quote, the contract called for four payments of $750,000 over 12 months. APCO was expected to give assistance free of charge to the Clinton Global Initiative as part of their effort to create a favorable environment to ensure the Obama administration made affirmative decisions on everything from Uranium One to the U.S.-Russia Civilian Nuclear Cooperation Agreement. Now, Campbell's attorney, Victoria Tunsing, says this all began in 2005. It was then, my client is told, that the Russians begin to plan strategically how they could take over uranium, particularly in the United States. And one of the key uh, proponent or uh, elements of that plan was to get this CFIUS approval to buy uranium one. APCO is denying any involvement with Uranium One and says their work with the Clinton Foundation and Russia are not connected. A Clinton spokesperson says that uh, Campbell's testimony is a distraction from the Russia probe. And Democrats are calling for the transcript of Campbell's meetings with these committees to be released. But Tunsing tells Fox News just moments ago that, quote, there was no transcript because three committees from houses, from uh, all houses involved, each had different rules for handling a transcript. Mr. Campbell and answered all questions from both Democrats and Republicans in a session that lasted over four hours. It's important to point out, guys, that there's a letter that was sent from Democrats Elijah Cummings uh, and Adam Schiff to Trey Gowdy uh, and Devin Nunes from those committees asking for something to be transcribed, which wasn't an appearance under oath, but rather an informal meeting with these committees from which this stems. But this is going to be a fight we're going to see start playing out. Uh, uh, and, and gain a little more steam over the next coming days. Every it would be, step of the way. It would be great to see a Democrat or a Republican be, you know, be uh, equally interested in the answers to that because it's national security, but I'm not holding my breath. Thanks, Griff. Thank you, Griff. All right, so just to recap, because it's very confusing, Russia hired this lobbying firm. It's called APCO here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to lobby for Uranium One. So they were paying them $3 million for lump sum payments every of 750000 every year, right? So it's $3 million a year. Right. And they're doing this to provide in-kind support. This is what this informant told the right. F told, this FBI informant said, to provide in-kind support for the Clinton's global initiative. Right. So basically to help anything with Uranium One get through. Sure. And, right. And Meanwhile, the expectation was that the, some of that money would funnel into the Clinton Foundation and then influence Hillary Clinton, who right. was Secretary of State. Meanwhile, Kellyanne Conway has uh, joining us this morning. She's Counselor of the hey, President of the United States. And after getting her briefing, she's giving us ours. Uh, Kellyanne, welcome back. Good morning. Wearing your green today. Absolutely. Right. And They're already lined up on Broad Street. The right. Yeah. Eagles and we just got reports the Eagles are Super Bowl champions. In Look fact, that. Uh, that is the shot of the people who also realize that. And it's quite early to line up. What time's the parade? The parade oh. is at 11 a.m. They're pretty hardy fans. They love, they've been waiting for this literally for a lifetime. And I just want right. to note that all through the season, not a single Eagles fan took a knee during the national anthem. And it's been a very prayerful team. It's coach, it's two quarterbacks, uh, Carson Wentz and Nick Foles right. are, are very uh, out in the open about how prayerful they are. And it's just been a delight for Eagles fans everywhere. I noticed that every 
bus and train and plane are basically sold out from Washington to Philly today. So it's an exciting day, and, and thank you for allowing a little bit of fandom. It's a busy news day here at the White House, Indeed. though. A lot going on with these budget caps and more money for six, roughly $6 billion for opioids, roughly $4 billion for veterans. Um, funding our military. This president is committed, first and foremost, to keeping us all safe. And this new deal would right. fund our military in keeping with the Pentagon's request, what General Mattis said yesterday from the podium, and in keeping with the National Defense Authorization Act. So we're very sure. pleased that that money is Kelly there Ann. for our men and women in uniform. The good thing is it does fund the government for a couple of years. It does increase the military spending. But you've got a whole bunch of members of the House Freedom Caucus. Their official statement is, hey, this thing spends way too much money. We came to Washington to cut the fat, and now we're adding on. I think this uh, particular thing goes up, uh, increases the size of government by 13 percent. For a lot of Republicans, that's go growing the wrong way. We can understand that, and this deal is not perfect. We need to see the final details, but at the same time, this president all along has called for certainty. You can't do these short-term things anymore. Right. You need a long, you need long-term certainty in an economy that's booming. All the economic fundamentals are there, due in large part to what this president and this Congress has been able to do over this last year. People feel it. The consumers are spending their money. The manufacturers are confident. We know small business formation is increasing. And, and people are just getting these bonuses and these raises. And even the capital investments is the untold story right. of the effect of this tax cut. So the economic fundamentals are there. You need to have the certainty in the budget. This gives, it that, gives us that through two, through, since uh, I think through about March of 2019. But it also provides that critical funding for infrastructure, for opioids, for veterans, and first and foremost, rebuilding our military. This president is rebuilding our military's readiness, but he's also rebuilding our military's morale. And he, both he, have been ignored for a very long time. Uh, he gets means testing for Medicaid, uh, $4 billion to make college more affordable. He ends the medical advisory board, extends CHIP for 10 years. It adds to the deficit, but the way I understand it, Speaker Ryan's going right back and is going to start working on entitlement reform immediately, beginning with welfare. And that might touch on the spending end that so many people are concerned about. Well, and Speaker Ryan, along with President Trump, Secretary Costa Labor, and so many others are working very, very hard toward workforce development. This is a White House and an administration that is committed to dignifying all types of careers. The president has spoken passionately and consistently about our need for skilled, a skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. He says back in the day, uh, they called it vocational technical education, uh, expanding those educational opportunities so that people can graduate high school or community college with a skill certificate and get right to work. We, we lack for welders and carpenters in this country. We lack for a lot of skilled labor. And of course, you know, with a booming economy under President Trump, we are a nation, as we say often, a nation of jobs in search of labor. And, and so the workforce development, the entitlement reform, uh, we want to dignify all types mm -hmm. of work. And we also want people to feel the encouragement to go and find, uh, find employment in, in a nation where okay. the unemployment rate is, is at is Kelly a Kellyanne, are they messing with your lights down there? Are they messing yes. with your lights down there? <laughs> I, know. Just, just, I don't right. know if they want me to start disco. Uh, yeah. 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 We just power through. Well, Kellyanne, right. I, I do think you, you bring up a good point. With the economy booming, then hopefully that can tackle some of this deficit. But we have to fund the military. Hats off to these First Republicans. And foremost. And, exactly. Republicans and Democrats doing that. Let's also talk about the new FBI techs that are just bombshells. With those two lovebirds at the FBI were still working at the FBI. One of those text messages says that President Obama wanted to be briefed on everything. What's Otis. your response? Well, I, show, I saw people showing the clips of President Obama in interviews saying that he does not interfere or ask about DOJ or FBI investigations. So people are going to have to square there where the truth is. Uh, it is very concerning to see two people uh, sexting each other about this investigation. I mean, texting each other about this investigation on and on. And, and now you see it goes all the way to the top, according to them anyway. And I think that when there's just an allegation or or a phrase ever mentioned from anybody in this administration, right. it gets parsed and conjugated to death. So I would hope that those who are so interested in doing that and calling for accountability and transparency and getting to the bottom of the 2016 election and the transition, by mm -hmm. the way, 
will apply that same standard and that same curiosity to these, uh, what seems to be never ending texts between these Good two luck. people who are in a position to know what was going on. Don't forget what they were doing over, the, what these two people were doing over at the FBI. So we should, we should know that. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how much has been revealed okay. just in the last couple of weeks about Christopher Steele, about the dossier, about these FBI agents. And this, this president has great respect right. for the rank and file in FBI, but we don't like what we see coming out of a few bad apples. Well, are you for uh, possibly making the FISA application public? We see that Grassley and Graham came out and said, I got a real problem with the way the dossier was used, the way James Comey backed up Christopher Steele, but uh, in a testimony. Should we all see these FISA applications? Should we learn more about this process? This president is for transparency and accountability in the main. I think that question really depends on a number of considerations that legal counsel, national security, our national security team would have to perhaps it, uh, review and advise, and, and certainly the Congress. So mm -hmm. I would leave it to those who have direct authority for that. But generally, we believe shining a light on it is, is useful to the public. I, uh, people should also be very concerned that there was scant attention given to the fact that political is back in the news. He somehow is involved here. Uh, that you've got you've got political operations and indeed the Clinton campaign at some point paying right. for the dossier. People should know that because it looks like very scant if any attention was given that in those in those actual applications. Oh, we're keeping an eye on it and so are a lot of congressional investigators. How about uh, that Nancy well, Pelosi yesterday? Well, how do you what explain that? that? She was uh, essentially filibustering something that she was in on negotiating. Well, that's right. And she, yes, and I'm not sure what she got out of it, except a lot of criticism from Democratic members today and also from dreamers. I, I read a, a bunch of quotes today in the, in the news accounts that they're not sure what she got for that and that they're very disappointed. By the way, serious leaders negotiate behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. They don't need to grandstand right. and showboat for all the world to see. She said she demanded certain things and walked away with none of them. It's the president who's been very clear about the four principles he expects right. from meaningful immigration right. reform. It's the wall. It's it's a right. resolution for the DACA recipients. It's the end of the visa lottery system and certainly an end to chain migration. So wh what all is right. she putting on the table? Eight hours on all one right issue now. and didn't get anything done. Kellyanne, I think you've got to pick up a phone. Uh, thank uh, We heard it ringing in the background. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to take the president President live at the National Prayer Breakfast here in about 45 minutes. I'm headed there in a moment with him. He'll right. do a great Thanks, job. Kelly. Thank Good you. Enough. And Thank then you. we're going to pay our light bill. Meanwhile, President Trump pushing for a military parade and the media goes nuts. France does it. So why can't Pete Hegseth? Uh, Pete Hegseth says, why can't we do it in France? If you I'm dreaming and imagining that Nancy Pelosi's finished and I'm home. Not everyone was impressed with minority leader Nancy Pelosi's eight hour and seven minute speech yesterday. Bless her heart. Take a look at that. Representative Doris Matsui from California struggling to stay awake during Pelosi's filibuster to protect dreamers on the House floor. Throughout Pelosi's speech, cameras caught Matsui dozing off multiple times. And that is just one of the images from yesterday's history breaking speech that Madam Pelosi gave. By the way, if I'm Mike Lindell right now, the guy who invented my pillow, I'd send one to every member of Congress. Right. right? Just take it into you the know, Do you hall. know those people, remember those people, if you go to hear a conference or something and you're ready, you know, it's, been, it's like, come on, let's get this over with. And then someone raises their hand, someone else raises their hand, and just people who like to hear themselves yeah. talk. If I were sitting there, I'd be like, really? Well, I bet two dollars. Eight she hours. Not, she was not the only one. But here's the, off. here's the thing. She set a record. I guess the last one was set. And we have some video of this. James Beecham, Champ Clark. Uh, his nickname was Champ for the people that knew him. Uh, he ran against Woodrow Wilson. He spoke for a really long time. Like five she, hours. She, right? she, yeah, she broke the record of eight hours. But here's the thing. There's no filibuster in the House, so she was literally ranting on about no DACA being included in this budget bill. Which, by the way, the deadline is March 6th, so there's no big deal. So she is making a stand to make sure no. No one interrupts her next speech and to show all the other Democrats that is 77 years old, she still has the endurance to lead. I just feel bad for those people who have to stand and listen to anyone for eight hours. Well, one of the stories she told was this one. I'm reminded of um, my own grandson. He had a very close friend whose name is Antonio, who's from Guatemala, and he has beautiful tan skin, beautiful brown eyes, and the rest. And um, 
this was such a proud day for me because when my grandson blew out the candles on his cake, they said, did you make a wish? And he said, yes, I made a wish. He said, well, what is your wish? He said, I wish I had brown skin and brown eyes like Antonio. <laughs> so beautiful. So beautiful. The beauty is in the mix. Give me a second and compose myself. What an emotional story. My child wants to be somebody else. That sounds like an intervention episode, not something that's going to get, well me up with tears. Ultimately, what uh, Nancy Pelosi was doing with that effective filibuster for eight hours is she was protesting the budget deal that she actually negotiated. So <laughs> go figure that. But she was trying to show everybody, look, I, I'm getting a lot of heat from my left wing. I'm working on it, even though I approve this. A lot of Dems said that, yeah, they were upset about it. They weren't giving their names. They yeah. said she shouldn't have done this. It was a political stunt because the president and his DACA plan is approving more than what the Democrats originally even wanted. I'll give you a name. Louis Gutierrez said, uh, an unabashed critic says, I assure you the leadership exercised its influence, the least of which is a floor speech. That wasn't effective, according to him. That's a Democrat. All Back right. in a moment with something really exciting. Guess at home. Write us. New video coming into our newsroom showing North Korea's military parade today. The event celebrating the 70th anniversary of the formation of their army. The timing of today's festivities is curious because typically this parade is held in April, coming at the end of uh, the period they normally do it. But now they're having it on the eve of the Winter Olympics in South Korea. Hmm. Coincidence? I don't think so. This is Vice President Pence wraps up his meeting with the South Korean president, pushing for more pressure on North Korea. Also breaking overnight, a police officer is shot and killed in the line of the duty. The unidentified officer gunned down responding to a call near Dallas, Texas. The suspect surrendering to police after an hours long standoff. The motive still unknown. And brand new pictures just released of bullet holes in the windshield of a police officer's car. The officer coming under fire not far from where that police officer we just told you died overnight. This officer was not hurt. All right, Ainsley. Thank you, Steve. Nancy Pelosi defending dreamers on the House floor for a record eight hours yesterday. But where was her eight hour speech defending angel families and the victims of illegal immigrants? Like our next guest, whose 18 year old son Joshua was killed by an illegal immigrant back in 2010. Joining us now is Laura Wilkerson with her side of the story. Good morning to you, Laura. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. So for folks at home, many of us have heard Josh's story. But for those who haven't, will you tell us what happened? Uh, sure. Josh was um, asked to give a kid a ride home from school. He was brought here illegally from Belize by his parents and I think overstayed a six month visa. Um, and anyway, Josh, he asked Josh for a ride home. Josh gave it to him. And what he did was beat him to death, torture him, strangle him uh, after death, tied him up like an animal, dropped him in a field and set him on fire. And he did this so that he could scrap Joshua's truck for some money. He, he needed some money and didn't know how to make it, so he had to, um, you know, that, that's what he resorted to, is wow. to do. That's so sad. Many people are Thank accusing you. Nancy Pelosi of putting illegal dreamers <laughs> ahead of American dreamers. Do you agree with that? I have to laugh at Nancy Pelosi. That story you just said about her, you know, her, her grandson her wanting his skin brown, or yes, wanting his skin brown, just, it, it makes me laugh. What a waste of time for Nancy Pelosi and the American public. Does she actually think that we don't know there are hardworking, honest people here that came in the door illegally? I mean, what a waste of time. We understand that. We know that. But what she doesn't understand is that about the law, which is it's kind of funny that she sits in the position she's in. You know, the law should cover all of that. That makes it non-racist, you know, across the board, not for special interest groups. And that's how we should follow everything that we do mm -hmm. so far. I mean, the, everything that we do. And uh, she just doesn't understand that. Are you okay with the president's immigration bill? And he's made it crystal clear that he wants to send the criminals home. You know, we just reported a few days ago about that Colts linebacker that was killed by a guy who allegedly killed by a guy who was deported two times. And the president wants those kinds of people, the criminals out. He's made it clear that the DACA kids can stay. And in fact, he increased the number to 1.8. Are you okay with that? 
Uh, yes, I am okay with that. I think he's doing everything he can to right this country in the way that we need to go moving forward. We have to make some, some concessions. I know that. Um, and, and, you know, we, we want good people here. I don't think they should have citizenship to be able to vote. But, you know, I am understanding that and compassionate enough to know that some people don't know their home country. I don't think they should be rewarded with anything except maybe being able to live here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want them to be able to vote and to be able to have a say in our in our um, political system. Well, we, we know that the mayor of New York is very liberal, and we've talked about sanctuary status here in our city. Um, this is an article that was just published. It says NYPD, the New York Police Department, got 1,526 requests to go and detain illegal immigrants under President Trump, but they were all tossed out. They totally ignored those requests. What do you, thought, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think they need to be let go. I mean, come on, you're, you sort of uphold the, the Constitution and to uphold law when you took an oath. And, and you know, that means any kind of law. We, we can't go back to the system when we don't share information with one source to the other source. I mean, how, how much would that take us back? It's ridiculous. It's not, um, it's not right. What's, what's your message to Nancy Pelosi and to these Democrats? Because I remember interviewing Kate Steinle's parents in California, and they said we didn't even really pay attention to Sanctuary City news. It just wasn't something that really affected us until it did, until we lost our daughter. Right. I think that it is the thing. You know, Nancy Pelosi's talk-a-thon, I think I can speak for all angel parents that would say, you know, we wish you'd do a shut-up-a-thon. And, you know, she, she just wasted her time, everybody's time yesterday. She doesn't seem to get it. And um, people don't know about sanctuary cities. You know, why do you need to offer people sanctuary from the law? I mean, and you don't know about it till it lands in your lap. So that, that really is the message to, to make people understand about sanctuary city and to get on board in their city and make sure that that's not how it, you know, how it goes. Nobody gets sanctuary from the law in this town. I don't care what color you are or where you're from. I know. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. Thanks. You're welcome. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau feeling the heat from his people kind comments. Now he says it was all a joke. Is Dana Lash buying that? She's next with a reaction. Plus, the cow ate my mail. The story behind this hilarious video that's going viral this morning. And Jillian Mealy is live in Philadelphia to join the party as the Eagles are celebrating their first Super Bowl victory ever. Hey, Jillian. Good morning. The sun is coming up. The crowds are getting bigger and we have a very important update on whether or not Julia said yes to the prom. We will tell you that update coming up in a few minutes. <laughs> Eagles fly the streets of Philly, turning into one huge party this morning. Very quiet in Boston. Millions expected to come out and honor the Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles. I think millions are already out. Jillian is one of the biggest <laughs> fans. She has been waiting her whole life for it today, and she's surrounded <laughs> by a lot of people who feel exactly the same way. Everyone is so happy. I can't even tell you guys. I, I wish that you could feel through the TV the mood right now. So when I saw you guys last, we introduced you to Will, Woo. who had a question for Julia. Julia, we go, probably. What did she say? She said, yes, it's a Super Bowl miracle. Yay. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's one bit of the excitement. All right, guys. Because I want to see the Eagles. Right? Who doesn't? Now, I understand this is what actually went down, is you came out here at 10 o'clock last night to hold the spot so you guys could stay sleeping and stay warm, right? Oh, doggone oh. it. Satellite problem. That was going so good. But we did break to J Julia. Yeah. We did break news. Yeah. Uh, so at least one couple is going to the prom. <laughs> up to everybody else to pair up. <laughs> he was a little too rowdy for you. You were suggesting that she doesn't go to prom with him. Right, I did. I'm not saying From so wise. From a father's move, perspective. But he did so. He is a celebratory. <laughs> Meanwhile, 25 minutes before the top of the hour, let's bring in Dana Lash, nationally syndicated radio talk show host uh, and famous author and knows a lot of stuff. Yesterday, we, found we, got, we got brought up, uh, we were talking about 2020 all of a sudden. Joe Biden was pleading his case, doing a bunch of interviews. And then you have President Obama's former wingman, Attorney General Eric Holder, legitimately thinking 
By the end of the year, he'll let us know if he's going to be running for president. Listen to this. Are you possibly thinking of running for office? You know, I'll see. Um, I'm focused on NDRC at this point, but I, I think I'll make a decision by the end of the year about um, whether or not there is another chapter in my government service. President. We'll see. Wow. What do you think, Dana? Yeah, we'll see. And Brian, by the way, I love that intro. I'm going to use that on my next book. That's my intro you know, on my stuff. next book. <laughs> um, it's good to see. <laughs> It's good to see you all this morning. morning. I, 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 he doesn't need to wait until the end of the year. Here's the answer. No. The answer is no. Eric Holder doesn't need to consider a run for any elected office, any appointed or elected office, or much less president of the United States. It would be historic, though, because let's not forget that he was the first AG who was held yes. in contempt of Congress. This was a guy who politicized the Department of Justice. You all remember him going after companies like Gibson Guitar, mm -hmm. all politically motivated. He went after them for using Rosewood in their fretboards, even though it wasn't prohibited. It was totally legal. He went after law enforcement officers officers. He, he conducted witch hunts in numerous police departments, including Ferguson, right by St. Louis in my hometown, impugned the characters of all these law enforcement officers. And then he withheld the results of this investigation that the DOJ conducted in Ferguson. And only after massive outcries statewide did he was he finally compelled to release it. And it completely exonerated the police department. And so John Fun described it as a sue and settle. That's kind of his tactic. But he really politicized the DOJ to a point where we're still dealing with the repercussions of this. Nobody wants to see that in elected office. Nobody wants to see that in the White House. Yeah, but Dana, you know, you brought up uh, a lot of the greatest hits for uh, Dana, for uh, Eric Holder, Eric Holder re from your point of view. But clearly, if he was to run for president, the mainstream media would thoroughly and aggressively vet him, don't you think? Oh, I know, because they thoroughly and aggressively vet every single person that, that affiliates uh, with the Democrat Party, don't they? I mean, they sort of proven themselves uh, incapable in that regard, which is why you see so many new media journalists pop up um, and why so many people watch you. Uh, because, they, I mean, those are the only people who are actually vetting any of these in, any of these candidates. So, no, we don't expect the media to do that. <laughs> hey, were you watching? Did you see that clip with Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of uh, Canada, when um, he was interrupted? Yes. He interrupted this lady. We, let's Show the clip to the folks at home who didn't see it, and then we want to get your reaction. Maternal love is the love that's going to change the future of mankind. So we'd like you to. Look uh, we, we like to say people kind, not necessarily mankind, because uh, yeah. it's more inclusive. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, the crowd there went wild. They're young, but most of the base, most of his base, <laughs> hated it. He came out and he said it was a dumb joke. Are you buying it? I'm not buying it because if, if, I, if that was so cringeworthy, that was so cringeworthy. He didn't say, oh, I'm joking or, you know, not. He, he wasn't joking. He was trying to virtue signal to the world. That's what his whole MO is. He just wants to virtue signal. And then he realized how hokey that it looked. And he interrupted. I find that incredibly ironic. Here's a man who's interrupting a woman to lecture her about the proper pronouns to use, uh, which is which fascinates me. That wasn't a joke. That was just him being a, the virtue signal, you know, wonder boy. Ugh. How, how long, you know, I know we don't want to go inside Canadian politics, but how long do you think this political correctness is going to last with our neighbors to the north? I don't know. They're very polite. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'm kidding. Now, that's a joke, Justin Trudeau. Yeah. That's a joke. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hope it does, because it, the PC-ness, people are t terrified to have honest discussions anymore. No one can have a discussion and speak from the heart, speak honestly, because every single thing, down from pronoun to you know, everything, is, is hyper-politicized. Yeah. And it's purposeful. It's purposeful. They want to silence people. Sure. And so that's what political correctness is. It's a tool to silence opposition. And it's shameful. Hey, Dana, before you go, it uh, looks like the Senate has come up with a plan to fund the government for a couple of years. Uh, some of the Democrats are upset there was no language about DACA. That's why Nancy Pelosi stood there mm. uh, half a day yesterday. And a, mem a lot of members of the House Freedom Caucus have said the, the government's spending way too much money. We went to Washington to cut the waste, not increase the debt. What do you make of this deal? 
No, I agree that it isn't perfect, um, and you're not going to get anything immediately perfect because, you know, it's government, it's Washington, D.C., but the whole goal should be to move the ball down the field. Uh, you know, and that's that's what the goal of this particular bill should be, is to move the ball down the field and, can, and incrementally get what you would like to see in terms of government spending reduced. I mean, believe me, I was a co-founder of, of the modern-day Tea Party yeah. movement. I mean, I was one of those individuals back in 2009, so this big government spending spending is very close to my heart. Uh, but at the same time, I also realize that I want to move the ball down the field and I don't want to lose the whole mm. thing by by overplaying my hand. Mm -hmm. I want to cut spending just as much as anyone. So I want to see the details that are in this plan uh, before I make a final decision. But hopefully we are moving the ball down the field and I'll wait to see that. Uh, I understand a lot of the spending has to do with the Trump agenda. So they got the spending in the right direction, according to the president. Uh, thanks so much, Dana. Always great to talk to you. Thanks, Dana. You, you do really know a lot of stuff. Good to see you all. All right. Goodbye. I thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. you all. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a great morning. All right, straight ahead. President Trump set to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast in just minutes. We are taking you there live at the top of the hour. Live. Plus, it's been a roller coaster ride on Wall Street. So, what does it all mean for your wallet? Stuart Varney has a wallet, and he's going to join us live next. Did it's a wonder wallet. Never, ever.